book of Genesis. As we continue our verse by verse study of the book of Genesis, we pick up where we left off last week in chapter 19, chapter 19 of Genesis. We will continue our verse by verse study from chapter 19. I think we will pick up from verse um, 24, somewhere around there. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here as we congregate in your house another time. We are grateful to you for the spirit of our lives, for the bread that we breathe, Lord, the food that is on, on our table. We thank you for shelter, for clothing. Thank you, O oh God, Lord, because we are your children. You are our God. You have saved us. You have delivered us. And you continue to keep us. Lord, even as we come together today, and we open up your holy words, bless us with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. I pray that the word of God will minister to us. The word of God will break yokes, hindrances, and barriers will be removed. Clearance will be given to your people. Your Shekinah glory will be felt in your house as we come together today. Bless us in Jesus' precious, wonderful name. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. So we are in Genesis chapter 19. And... In uh, verse uh, Genesis chapter 19, chapter 19, and we uh, pick up in verse 18, sorry, verse 24, sorry. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Now, we are talking about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember that the Lord sent two angels into Sodom and Gomorrah to investigate and to um, get firsthand information about the wickedness, the grievous sins that was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. And you remember that um, those, uh, the men of Sodom and Gomorrah, they tried to have homosexual relationship with the law, uh, with the with the angels, and uh, the angels blinded them, and still they was trying to pursue to have um, uh, interference with these angels. And uh, the angels, they were able to pull Lot and his wife and his two daughters out of Sodom and send them towards the mountain. Lot didn't want to go to the mountain. He wanted to go into a city. And he went to that city. Eventually, he didn't stay there. So we are talking about the destruction. Lot is out of Sodom. And uh, here the Bible is telling us that in verse 24, that the Lord, Jehovah, the Lord reigned upon Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Now, what I'm seeing here is that the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, um, homosexual activity, um, have a direct connection with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, there are some people who will disagree with that because they are uh, homosexual Bible interpreters. You know, they're, they're, they're homosexual Bible interpreters out there, right? Homosexual Bible interpreters will want us to believe that homosexuality have nothing to do with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And they will say, they will take references like they will go into Ezekiel. I think it's Ezekiel chapter 16, if I remember correctly. There's, um, in one of those chapters, Ezekiel, the Lord was making reference to what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah and what the Lord said. He made mention of their um, fornication and adultery, make mention of their, their greed and their lack of um, care for the needy, and uh, you talk about their prosperity, and they become so um, comfortable in whatever they were doing. They become comfortable in their sins. But um, homosexuality was not mentioned there. So because of that, um, these men and women who um, on that in that kind of a lifestyle, they use that to interpret to say that it wasn't because of uh, homosexuality why Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. And also they will say, well, uh, even Jesus did not mention anything. Jesus didn't give any um, condemnation 
He didn't mention anything in regards to homosexual uh, lifestyle, so therefore there's nothing wrong with it. But, you know, even though Jesus did not mention anything about homosexual lifestyle, um, still we have mentioned in other parts of the Bible. We have uh, the epistle, we have Paul talk about it. Even when you look in the book of Romans chapter 1, which we might make some reference to today, you see that there, there's writing there about these things. So what I'm trying to say is that the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, it came about because of the, the wicked lifestyle that was um, the people was involved in. They were in, involved in those, um, you know, unnatural lifestyle, unnatural relationships, and therefore God rained down fire and brimstone upon them. And I know we talk about people who will say, well, you know, isn't the world in a similar situation today? Don't we have a lot of um, homosexuality going on in the world today? Don't we have a lot of, um, you know, um, unnatural relationship taking place in the world today? Yes, there's a lot of uh, homosexuality taking place in the world today. And I think one person said that if God don't destroy America, God will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. But also there's a lot of... Um, Righteous people, um, spiritual people, people who are praying and people who are trying to stay grounded and trying to stay in tune with the Lord. So therefore, I believe that's the reason why God is merciful. Although there is a lot of wickedness in the world today, I believe that the reason why God, uh, Jesus, don't already return is because He is merciful, He is kind, and He is compassionate, and, you know, He is given the world time to repent, time to turn. But it's not because God um, turned a blind eye to what is taking place. God is angry. God is grieved with, you know, the wickedness that is in the world. God is um, angry at sin. God can't look on sin. But, you know, he loved the sinner, but he hates the sin. But he always gives um, man a time to repent, a time to change. And I think this is the time that we are living in. We are living in the time where, when God is giving us extra time. It's like we are going over time. You know, it's like when you uh, have a, a soccer game or hockey game, they talk about overtime and stuff like that. God is giving us overtime. We are on overtime. And we have to be grateful. Praise the name of the Lord. And uh, the Bible tells us in verse 25, um, of, uh, Genesis, of Genesis chapter 19. He said, And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. So here we see that the whole, those, two, those, those cities, I think it's about five cities there. Eh? Solomon Gomorrah was mentioned, but I think it had three other cities that was involved. And all of those places that was carrying on um, with their unnatural behavior, doing things that was not pleasing in the sight of the Lord. The Lord destroyed all of those cities. And even the, 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 the plantation, vegetation was destroyed. You know, all the plant life and the animal life, everything was destroyed. And sometimes people will try to point fingers at the Lord and say, why would God do that? Why would He destroy women and children? Why would He destroy the animals? But everything belongs to God. The earth is the Lord, and the fullness thereof, the silver and the gold, the cattle of the thousand hill, all belongs to God. The reason why God is God is because God can do whatever He feels like. And sometimes people can't, they can't swallow that. People can't swallow the fact that God can do whatever He, he chooses to do. He is God. And I'm fine when God decides to do whatever He wants to do. I'm fine with that. You know, I may not agree, you know, but I'm fine with it because he's God. Praise the Lord. Amen. So he, he, he um, overthrew uh, those cities. And the time will come when this world will be overthrown. And I think, you know, Solomon Gomorrah should stand as a warning to every person upon the face of the earth today. And I think this story has been told all over, you know, I don't think there's many people who probably don't hear something about Sodom and Gomorrah. Because the word Sodomy, when you talk about the word Sodomy, Sodomy came from that word. 
and this is something that is all over. So I think God has this as a warning. It's a, it's, a, it's a sign of judgment. And people should take warning when they, they hear even the, the very mention of that word, sodomy or Sodom and Gomorrah, because it, it talks about destruction. It talks about the, the judgment of God upon a sinful lifestyle. And it tells us, praise the Lord, in verse 26, But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillow of salt. Now, Lot and his wife and his two daughters, they were on their way out. Although they did not want to leave, Lot was hesitant in leaving. The angel, remember, grabbed him by the hand, grabbed his wife and his daughters by the hand and started pulling them to safety, you know, and uh, uh, they are all outside the city, and uh, yes. It, it seems to me, okay, there is a big attack against God concerning Satan and God. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think that um, Satan wanted an um, angel to get married? Well, I, I already know, I, I don't know for sure about that, if he wanted angels to get married. I, I can't really answer that, really, because, you know, that, that would be going beyond the scope of what we have, the information that we have. <laughs> I, I, I can't really answer that because I don't really know. I, I never really um, do any kind of a study or hear anything about that. What, what, okay. Yeah, just because what I'm saying here, okay, now the angels and defects from heaven, mm -hmm. and they come and they mingle with women right. and have children. And now Satan wants to get back to God based on Genesis chapter 9 when he told Abri um, Abraham to multiply and replenish. Mm -hmm. And now um, you see there is a big a constant attack, man with man. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if the angels are confused and saying, okay, you know, I, find, I feel God is unfair. Angels are allowed to marry. But you see, all of those, uh, all of those nat unnatural behavior, all of those sinful habits and lifestyles that we see in the world today, it came out of the fall. It came because Adam and Eve rebelled against God. Every sinful thing that we see today is not new. All, none of them is new. There is no sinful, there is nothing new. According to what the Bible says, there is nothing new upon the face of the earth. All of the sinful activities that we see going on today, it's not new. It came out because of the fall. And maybe some of them probably was not rampant in Bible time, but... It, it, it was there. It came out because of the fall. Yes, uh, Sister Lowe's, what do you have to say? Yes, I don't know if that is the question he asked, but to me, what I, um, I'm thinking that in before our time here, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Hold on. Yeah, I was wondering, like how the people here, like the gays, right? Mm -hmm. They're hugging each other and they're kissing, they're married you know, and everything. I wonder if it's in the time of um, Sodom and Gomorrah, if they should do the same thing, like what they do, it was like what's going on here now. I'm thinking. Yeah, well, because I'm uh, getting, you know, that puzzling me. So explain uh, for me. Homosexual lifestyle is not a new thing. It, 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 it's happening in Bible time. It, it, it's happening way back. And uh, even some interpreters, and uh, this is not, you don't have to take my word on it, some interpreters, because we, we touched on that when we was dealing with Noah and his grandson. Some interpreters are even saying that maybe there is some kind of a, a natural behavior between um, Noah's grandson when Noah went in and found, when Noah's grandson went in and Noah was drunk when he drank the wine. Some people are saying that there's some kind of unnatural behavior there. But what we are saying is that homosexuality, lesbianism, and all of these things, they, it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. They, they are not new. They are not new. And um, a lot of these um, kings that we have in, uh, of Rome, and a lot of these um, kings, you know, from way back, a lot of them was big uh, into um, homosexuality. And, uh, you know, a lot of these leaders, they used to have a group of young men who used to provide services for them. And that is not say that they don't have their wife. They have their wife also. But they were bisexual. They were, they were doing, they were going, um, you know, both ways. So uh, that's what I'm trying to communicate to us, that these things are not new. 
Go ahead, sir. And I, I think according to Scripture, Scripture gives us understanding that in, in Canaan, yes. the Canaanites used to practice all those sort of corrupt things. Well. Right. They used to practice yeah. all kinds of things. So, okay, we, we were saying that um, um, Lot and his family, they uh, escaped Sodom and Gomorrah. We are in uh, Genesis chapter 19. We started out at verse 24. And they are outside the city. And the Lord rained down fire and brimstone from heaven on Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, here we see that the command was given to them that they should not look back. God, uh, the angel said to them, give them a, str- a strict warning. Don't look back. Don't turn back. And here the Bible is telling us in verse 26, But his wife look, but his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pill of salt. So here we see that Lot's wife looked back, as the Bible says, from behind him, and she became a, a pill of salt. And it seems as though Lot's wife, she was a, 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 from, the, from, from Sodom and, or from Gomorrah. She was not from Abraham's family. As we said last week, I can't remember if there's any way where it tells us that Lot went uh, to Sodom or when he left Abraham, he had a wife. I can't remember that. So um, it seemed as though he got his wife from um, Sodom, from that area. So uh, it is believed that her mind, even though she was outside the city, she was dragged outside the city by the angels, her mind was still in Sodom and Gomorrah. She was still focusing on maybe her possession, maybe her house. Maybe she was thinking about, because we said that there's a possibility that she probably have two other grown children, daughters, who was married. Maybe her mind was on uh, her family, her friends, her relatives, her possession. But it seems as though her mind was still in Saddam. And it shows the kind of a grip the hole that Sodom and Gomorrah had on the lives of these people. And, you know, we, we ought not to be so quick to um, condemn them, because when we talk about um, things of the past having a hole on people, a lot of us who become saved, we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. Even as we uh, get out of that life, Sometimes some of these things that we used to be involved in before still have a strong hold on us. And some people keep going back and forth, in and out. You know, one time you get away from it, another time you go right back into it. And it seems as though that um, Lot's um, wife, she was more or less in that situation. Her mind was on Sodom, on Gomorrah. But you see, we have to make a, a full break. We have to break away from the world. The Bible said that we must love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loved the world, the love of the Father was not in him. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, all these are not of the Father, but of the world. The world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God shall abide forever. One of the things that was a stronghold in the life of Lot is that Lot loved the things of the world. Lot have a strong uh, connection. He loved the things of the world. Because, you know, when he uh, departs from Abraham, I don't think he had the intention to go into Sodom. His intention was to go and do, um, you know, with his sheep. Because remember, he chose the best part of the land. His intention was to go and, you know, have his sheep and his cattle and all of his animals and, you know, become wealthy. But it is believed little by little, as the Bible said, he go closer and closer to Sodom and Gomorrah. And then when we started out in chapter 19, we saw where he was sitting at the gate of Sodom. What that means is that he become a prominent um, person in Sodom and Gomorrah. He was pronouncing judgment. He was like one of those guys down at City Hall, counselors. And uh, he was heavily involved. He was drawn in. And what that is showing us is that we have to be careful with the world. And the, 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 the influence of the world is so strong. The, the, the things of the world is so strong. Brethren, that we can't take chance. 
And sometimes people say, well, you know, you don't have to distance yourself so far from these things, you know. And sometimes people think that you can get a little bit close. And it's like um, they were, uh, there, there's a saying about this um, person who was looking for a driver, this wealthy person who was looking for, I mean, I put it in the right context, but talk about this wealthy man who was looking for a driver to drive him around. And he is um, interviewing. He has these drivers who come in to test. And, you know, some of these drivers, when they come in, he put them to drive close to a cliff. And when they drive the vehicle, they try to go as close as they can to the, to the, the edge of the cliff. But they, they're not falling over. But they'll go maybe two, three inches from the edge of the cliff. And they figure by doing that, that will influence um, this person who was looking for the driver. But uh, the person was not influenced by those drivers who go close to the edge of the cliff. The person who got the job is the person who stay as far away from the cliff as they can. And a lot of times, that is how we operate. We try to go as close as we can to sin. And, you, you know, once you don't sin, you try to go as close, you know, as close as you can. But once you don't actually do um, the act, we think that we are saved. But the influence of the world, the influence of sin, it is so strong. That is the reason why the Bible says we're supposed to what? Flee. What does the word flee mean? Run away. The Bible says we're supposed to flee youthful lust. We're supposed to flee fornication. Things like fornication and adultery and all of these kind of things, it is powerful. And we can't get close to these things. You have to run away from them. You know, uh, you're a single man, you're a single woman, and you getting close to somebody of the opposite sex, finding yourself being alone, you know, even though you might be saying, well, we're having Bible study or we're having prayer meeting, you've got to be careful. You've got to be careful because those things are very powerful. Yes, go ahead. Yes, concerning Lot's wife, it was a sign of apostasy with there, and why the Bible states that Lot's wife turned to a pillar of salt. Why do you use the word pillar of salt specifically mm-hmm. and not turn to a pool of water? But as an uh, animal or something, but why do you use that um, thing there? A pillar of salt, and it was a form of apostasy with, um, with Lot's wife. Well, it was a form of uh, apostasy. It, it, uh, it means to turn back. And uh, there, she was warned not to turn back. And uh, that have, even Jesus, Jesus, when uh, Jesus gave us, um, he made a statement, and he said, remember Lot's wife? And he was talking about the end time, and he was talking about uh, worldly goods and possession. And he said, when the end time comes, um, and you get away from the, the test or the trials that is going on, if you get up on the house stop, if you find yourself on the house stop, and you forget that you have your gold ring or your gold watch or something valuable down in your house, he said, don't leave from the house stop and go down back into your house to get whatever you forget. It doesn't matter about how valuable it is. And he used the word, he said, remember Lot's wife. And what that is saying is that turning back. And the brother mentioned the word apostasy. That is what it means. When you turn back, it means that, you know, you become an, an apostate. So she turned back. And the second question he asked about uh, why she was turned into a pill of salt. The Bible never gave us any um, explanation why a pill of salt. But all I could say is that God used a pillar there so it become a, like a monument. And it, it is something that we can have an, an, as an example. It is something to act as a warning to everybody else. Because I was reading this morning where one writer was saying, even in that area today where they believe Sodom and Gomorrah was, you still will find pillars of salt. You know, little monuments of salt um, coming up. So that was, I think, was an example to all of us. So the Bible says that she, she looked back. And her mind, as I was saying, her mind was still hooked. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah still have her mind. And she looked back. But I don't know if you guys noticed what it said there. It said, but his wife looked back from behind him. 
I, I was wondering if Lot, if he did everything that he could to save his wife. Uh, and this is, uh, I don't see anything in the Bible that r- relates to that, but this is just what comes into my mind. Did Lot do everything that he can to save his wife? Uh, if he had, if, if he had uh, placed his wife in front of him, would his wife be saved? Would she escape? Let's suppose when they, the angel departs from them, Lot take command, uh, take command of his family. And he put them in front of him. He leads them out. Or he grabbed them by the hand. And he run in with them. But here the Bible says she looked back from behind him. I personally would think that in a, in a time of, um, you know, crisis. You know, if there's a fire. <laughs> let's suppose there's a fire. And you're running out of the house. You as the man of the house. What would you do? Run out and leave your wife behind. Run out and leave your, your, your children behind. What will you do? You push them out. You have to get them in front of you. Pastor, I, what I see in there, I see, okay, like, Lot wife was a believer. She was believing God. And maybe if Lot was, if Lot was a righteous man, and maybe she used to believe her husband. But if it's like a, a pastor, see, you know, maybe she gets to, to dis, the, have a great disbelief in God. She don't believe in God no longer. I, I don't think so. I, I don't think she was a believer. Because he said apostasy. I don't think she was a believer. I think she was, heavy, she was heavily influenced by Saddam. And we will see that with her children. Her daughters was heavily influenced by Saddam. Even Lot. Lot was heavily influenced by Saddam. Even Lot. Lot, Lot almost lost his salvation in my explanation, in my belief. Lot, Lot becomes saved by the skin of his teeth. And the Bible will point out in this same chapter that it is because of Abraham why Lot was saved. Lot wasn't saved on his own merit. God saved Lot because of his uncle Abraham. Yes. So, um, as I was saying, I think, in my opinion, I think if Lot, he he probably should have put her in front, although this 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 may not have any bearing on what we're talking about, but in my, my um, the way I look at it here, I think that Lot was, he was maybe slothful and careless in the sense that he allowed her to be behind in a time of Christ, crisis. You know, um, the Bible says a man supposed to love his wife as he loves himself. You have to esteem them and you have to, you have to put them before you and all of that. Uh, a man supposed to love his wife even... Uh, more than his own life. Yes. Um, Abraham, he will set up an altar. And he will, you know, fellowship with the Lord. And here we see that same place uh, where he stood before the Lord. He went back to that same place. And uh, to look. And to see what was going on. And, you know, we should have something like that in our life. You know, where fellowshipping with God is concerned. And a lot of times, uh, the place where we're supposed to be in, where we're supposed to be with God, we are not there. We need to get back to that place. Get back to the place where we stand before God. We, 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 we talk about that a while back, standing before God, fellowshipping with the Lord. And he, Abraham did that. He went back to that place where he stood before the Lord. And uh, in verse 28, and he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and towards all the land of the plain. And behold, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. So here we see Abraham is like he's on a hill looking down at Sodom. And he's seeing all of the evidence of the smoke going up from the flames and from all of the burning that was taking place in Sodom and Gomorrah. He's seen all of the evidence. And I believe that this probably stuck in the mind of Abraham for the rest of his life. He saw what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. That was a message to him. And you know, when we look at the lives of people that we know who rebel against God and refuse to, to, to live um, a life that is acceptable in the sight of God, and we see 
um, what take place in their lives, brethren. That should be um, a, a, a sign of warning to all of us. Just like how I believe this was a sign of warning. Solomon Gomar was a sign of warning to Abraham. People, when we look at people who we grew up with, or people who you used to hang with before you received Christ, and you receive Christ and then you start warning them about their lifestyle, and they wouldn't change. And then you see what happened to them. I remember, you know, when I was living in Trinidad, there was, you know, back in those days, I'm a young man growing up in all of my strength and stuff like that, you know. And uh, we used to, um, I used to work with um, this um, guy. I'm not going to mention his name. I used to work with him. And he was a young man also. And, you know, when he was my boss, because he was running the, the, the job, it's his job, and I was working with him. And, you know, when he come to work, he will boast and he will tell me, you know, boy, Brother Duncan, man, I have uh, this amount of women. I have six women and, you know, I go by one every night. And he will talk about what go on the night and stuff like that. And, man, you should hear the, 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 the things, you know, he's talking about these women and how they're crazy about him. And I'll say to him, I'll say, listen, man, you ought to, you, you to be careful, you know. That time AIDS just came out. And I used to warn him, I said, listen, you ought to be careful, man. You ought to be careful. You're young and you're strong now. But if you continue like that, you're going to cut your life short. And he laughed. He said, no, man, that would never happen. <laughs> Lo and behold, he's no more. He's already gone. And, you know, if you have a few more young men that I know who used to act in that same way. And I'll warn him and say, listen, you have to be careful. That kind of lifestyle that you're living Having six women and running around as if, well, women is going out of style. You're not going to last. You're going to cut your life short. I always said to them, you're going to cut your life short. And I can remember there's three guys that I know. And if I, maybe if I mention names, some of you are going to know some of them. That I know die prematurely. They die when they were young and maybe in their early 30s. Why? Because um, they want to live that kind of lifestyle. And when I look at their life and see how they... It's not that I was better than them. The reason why, I, if I was living the same kind of lifestyle too, I want to be here too. And, you know, so when I see these things, I see these as a warning, as something to say, stay away from that kind of thing. And this is how we need to look at it. Praise the Lord. Okay, we move on. It says that um, uh, in verse 29, And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities, of the plain, that God remember Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he uh, overthrew the cities in the, which Lot dwelt. So this is what we were saying there. Lot was only saved because of his uncle Abraham. <laughs> God in his mercy. It's, had it not been for um, Peter, Peter tell us that he made mention of that righteous man living amongst them, and he was um, disturbed by the filthy conversation of the wicked. If Peter, the Apostle Peter, did not call Lot a righteous man, if there was no mention in the New Testament about Lot as a righteous man, we today will not regard Lot as a believer. We only regard Lot as a believer today because Peter mentioned that he was a righteous man. Because when we look at the, his lifestyle, the way how he loved the world, and the, the, the greed that he had for, for, for wealth and stuff like that, how he was influenced by what is going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. Look what he did. He was preparing to deliver up his two virgin daughters. He was going to give them to those men of the city so that they could have their way with him. So had it not been for what Peter tell us, um, we may not uh, regard Lot as a believer. But here the Bible is telling us that he was only saved because God remember Lot. No, God remember Abraham. You remember Abraham. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now it tells us in verse 30. Did I skip a verse? And Lot went up out of Zor and dwelt in the mountains and his two daughters with him. For he feared to dwell in Zor. And he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. So here we see that, remember he didn't want to go to the mountain. Uh, the angel told him, flee to the mountain. No, I'm afraid. 
you know, because he wants to stay close to Sodom and Gomorrah. He's comfortable when he's close to Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't want to go to the cave. I don't want to go to the mountain because if I go to the mountain, maybe a lion, a bear, some animal might come and destroy me. So I want to go into the city. Lo and behold, he went to the city and he could not stay there. Because the lifestyle of those people in that city didn't, um, probably was maybe the same as, as Sodom and Gomorrah. It, th- that city was not destroyed because the angel allowed Lot to go there. But if the angel, if Lot didn't say he wants to go to that city, there's a possibility that that city also would have been destroyed. That city was only saved because of Lot. And what we are seeing there is that Lot, he lost everything. You notice that? Everything, everything that he, he, he tried to gain, all of the sheep, all of the, the wealth that he accumulates, you know, he lost everything. And I think this should send a message to us. And the message is that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. It doesn't matter what we pile up here on earth. If God is not with us, we are going to lose everything too. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain this whole world and suffer the loss of his own soul? And uh, the scripture tells us that he was in a cave, living there with his two daughters. And verse 31, and the first, and uh, the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father <clears throat> is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drunk, drink wine, sorry, and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed after our father. So here, these two ladies, the oldest one is leading. She is thinking here that there is no more men upon the face of the earth. But the thing is, um, she just came out from that city. I guess what some uh, interpreters are saying, because of the enormity of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, she believed that probably the whole world was destroyed and uh, there was no more men. So she decided that she's going to take uh, matters into her hand and she is going to um, give her father wine to drink. She's going to make him drunk. And when he becomes drunk, she's going to lie with him so that seed can be preserved. And that is just showing us how um, the, the influence, how strong an influence the lifestyle of the people in Sodom and Gomorrah had on Lot, his wife, and his children. Could you imagine that? That is something that is disgraceful. And it doesn't matter how, um, you know, you might say, well, man is short or you don't, you don't have any prospect of getting a man. Who is going to stoop to that level? Their mind is twisted. Their mind was twisted. And, uh, you know, they, they wasn't trusting God. They wasn't believers. And they wasn't trusting God. And because of that, they go to any limit, any length, so that they can fulfill their, their cravings. And, you know, I think um, uh, young single women in the church have to take warning. I think I'm going to get myself into a little bit of trouble here. I don't know if anybody wants to hear me, uh, hold me. <laughs> I think single women need to take warning. When they look at the decision that Lot's two daughters make here, these women think that that was the end of the world and they wasn't going to get any men. So they decide that they're going to stoop to that level, make their father drunk so that they can lie with him and have seed uh, or children preserved. And we have seen something similar in the church today. There's a lot of single women in the church. What they're saying is that, there's no men in the church. The church don't have no men. Maybe there's a point there. The church don't have men. There's not a whole, a whole lot of men in the church. So therefore, you know what they're saying? They're going outside. They're going outside the church to find a man. Because there's no men in the church. And some of them would even take it a little bit further. And they will say that, you know, the unsaved men treating women better than Marry, than, than Christian men. So they have a better chance of getting a good man outside who is not a Christian 
than getting, even though they can get a Christian man, it seems as though they will rather choose to get a man outside than to get one inside because they said that Christian men are um, not treating their, their, their wives good. They don't treat, uh, the unsaved men treat their wives better than the Christian men. But I'm, I'm saying here to you, you guys today, those of you who are here today, you're single, don't fall into that trap. I am around for a good time. I, 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 I become a Christian in 1974, and that's a long time. And in my time of being in the church, I have never seen where a saved woman married to an unsaved man and they continue living together as husband and wife for a long time. I've never seen it happen. I, I don't know if anybody ever sees it. Go ahead. Go ahead, sister. Yes. No, Anselm came in the church. Anselm was in the church. Well, I was there. My sister bring Anselm in the church. Well, well, I don't know. Listen, I don't know if they have sexual relationships before they become married. I, ain't go, I don't know that. But what I'm saying is that, <laughs> um, yes, she probably brought him in. She brought him in, but he become baptized. He, he accept Christ. Not in that context. Not in that context I'm talking about. I'm talking about a woman who married to an unsaved man. Um, Sarah, I know Sherry um, picked him up outside, but he came in. He came in and he become baptized. And... Uh, uh, before, before he um, married, and he was baptized? But that's what I'm saying. I'm not talking about that. No, well, I'm not talking about that type. I'm not, that, uh, that's, not, that's not what I'm talking about. I ain't talking about that. I know that have more or less like a similar kind of thing, but I'm talking about that. I'm talking about people who go outside and marry to unsaved. I ain't talking about, well, look at, I don't want to mention any name here either. <laughs> But what I'm saying, I, I understand what you're saying, Sister McKenzie, but I'm not talking about in that way. I'm talking about somebody who leaves the church and they go outside and marry to an unsaved man. I'm talking about somebody who go outside and they have this unsaved guy and the unsaved guy, you know, decide to come to church and the unsaved guy become born again. I'm talking about that. That is, that is different. I'm talking about those who go outside and they not bring no man into the church. They not bring the unsaved man into the church. They married outside. I have never seen any happen like that, and it worked out. As I said, I don't know if uh, <laughs> I don't know if Sherry was doing anything. She well, she was not supposed to because she was supposed to be born again. So I don't know if she was doing anything. Nobody in my time, because you, if you remember correctly, we have people like Sister Johnson and Sister um, Kettles and all of these people who was like watchdogs over the church. And if something was going on um, with Sherry and, and Slim, somebody would have said something. I never hear anybody say that they was doing anything before they married. Okay, all right, all right. Let's just leave it there. Let's, let's, let's leave it there. All right, um, what are we talking about? Um, okay, where we are? Yes, so um, unsaved, married into an unsaved person is not something that is, um, uh, the Lord permits and is not something that Christians are supposed to do. And whether or not you like it, yes or no, whether or like you, you want to hear me say it, yes or no, it is wrong in the sight of God. And when we do it, we are breaking God's command. And it doesn't matter how we want to style it or how we want to put it. Um, it is not right in the sight of God. And the scripture said we're not so, supposed to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And anybody who breaks that command, they're going to pay. They're going to pay for it. Okay, it says, um, what else it have here? It says that, according to what I'm seeing here, they feel that there wasn't going to be enough men for them. And they make that decision. And, you know, it is true that there's not a whole lot of Christian men 
in the church today. That, that's a fact. There is more women in the church than men. And, you know, people, because of the fact, when they look around and see that there's not a whole lot of uh, women, men in the church, they make a decision to go outside. And, you know, I think that those of you who have Christian men, those of you women that have Christian men, you have to thank God. You have to thank God. Those of you who have Christian men, you have to thank God that you have a man that is a Christian. Because there's not a whole lot of Christian men in the church today. And a woman who have a, a, a committed husband who is a Christian, it is something that you have to thank God about. You have to, you have to be grateful. And a lot of times, the way how we act today, as if, well, you know, it's just a bomb you have, even though he's a Christian man, and, you know, you have him in the church, we, we see him as he's just like a bomb, and, you know, who cares if he leaves, and, you know, I'll get somebody else. You think so? There's not a whole lot of good Christian men out there. And I'm saying a lot of you guys are supposed to be grateful. And, you know, sometimes when I talk like that, I get into trouble and people get upset. So get upset. Get in a hop and a puff. But a lot of you need to be grateful for, if you have a Christian man, you need to be grateful. And I'm not saying we as men, we're not supposed to be grateful for our wives too. I'm grateful for my wife. But what I'm saying, what I'm saying, what I'm saying, you who have a Christian man, you need to be grateful to God. You need to be grateful to God because um, there's not a lot out there. And, you know, sometimes the way how I see some Christian women acting and treating their husband. I'm saying here, if you had an unsaved man, you will never get away with that. You won't be able to do it. A lot of, a lot of the way I see some of these um, saved women treating Christian men, um, if you are married to an unsaved man, you will never get away with it. And a lot of times that some of these guys just have to suck it up. And I know you're not going to hear a lot of people bold enough to make these statements. Because when you, when you talk like this, people are going to jump on you. And people are going to, um, ready to attack. But say what? Say what? It is true. The truth is the truth. And uh, seriously, if, if some of you guys who always, you know, throwing stones at men and talking about men and stuff like that. If you think about it, if you think about it. You need to be grateful because if God didn't bless you, and it's a blessing, that husband that you have is a blessing. If God, hold on, hold on a sec. If God didn't bless you with that man that you have, and you was out there with an unsaved man, some of the things that you do doing to that man, you will never able to do it to that unsaved man and get away with it. <laughs> you should know why. <laughs> <laughs> they hide behind the cross, so to speak. Because they figure that, regardless of what, he's not going to go to anywhere. He believes, not believe in divorce or separation or what, so I can get away with it. Both ways, not just for the women, men and women. Well, it has but some... When, when, when they are with somebody who's in the world, they know the competition is tight out there. <laughs> Once you slip, you slide. So they stay sharp. Who, who stay sharp? When they are with the unsafe people in the world, right. they stay sharp. Because yes. No one to slip the slide. Right. If somebody else is going to do it. You should take your spot. But when you're with a Christian man, he ain't going nowhere. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's it's not really even. It's it's not really even because the thing is there is there is more women available than more men. And that is the reason why that, um, as the, 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 the brother was making that statement, there is more women available. You know, um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of women out there. If a, if a man leaves his wife today, and I'm not encouraging any man to leave their wife, you know, the first thing, there's somebody else available, even right in the church. Even right in the church. Maybe your sister who's sitting next to you might be available for, for, to take your husband. This is what I'm saying. It's not to say I'm encouraging these things. 
And you guys just take these things. When I say these things, you take it and you get upset and you get angry. But these are things that you're supposed to look at. And because it's a blessing. It's a blessing that you have a husband and you have a Christian husband. Because when you go around in the church today, when you go around in the church today, there's so many good women out there who don't have no, 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 no man. They don't have no, no husband. And it's not to, not to say that they are bad. But it, they just don't have any. And you have one today, you should count that as a blessing. And you should thank God for him. And instead of some of the time that we, we run them down and we say all these kind of negative things about them. I'm not saying that men are perfect, they're not perfect. Sometimes we behave bad. But I'm saying if you have one and he's a Christian man, thank God for him. Because if you let him go and you go out there, you're not going to get a better one. <laughs> They, 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 <laughs> they don't have to stay there, sister. They, it, 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 happening, it happening in some churches, some of these big churches. Some of these big churches, some of these guys, you have guys in some, hold on. You have guys in some of these big churches who married two times, three times in that one church. Pick women in that one church. And the thing is, most of the time, if the, the fourth wife will not stay. You know, they will, they will move and go somewhere else because, as you said, they, they don't want to get into no conflict. So, a lot of times, instead of the woman stay there, she will just leave and she go. But it is not, uh, it, it's happening. And it's happening out there regular. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay right there. And uh, I, I know some of you guys are upset, but you better let that simmer. Let it simmer. Let it, let it just simmer with you and go over it because what I'm saying, it is the truth and, you know, I know the truth hurts at times, but there is nothing that is better to hear than when you hear the truth of God's word. We need to pray for families. We need to pray for um, husband and wives. We need to pray for wives, pray for husbands, because the enemy is on a mission to destroy the family. And any kind of a, um, inroad that the enemy has to attack the family is going to attack the family. So let us pray for one another and let us be faithful. Let us treat one another with respect. Praise the name of the Lord so our relationship will continue. God bless us. Any, any comment or any question before we close? All right. Father, we thank you today. We praise you. We worship you. Lord, continue to bless us as we uh, open up your words. Help us, O oh God, to be faithful in our interpretation of the Word of God. Give us understanding of your words and help us, O oh God, to be truthful. O oh God, we pray that you bless us as we go forward in Jesus' precious, wonderful name.